Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Linda. Good morning, Alicia. Good morning, Nicole. Good morning, Cece. Good morning, Jay. Good morning, Michi. Good morning, Jackery. Good morning, Donna. Good morning, Eugenia. Good morning, Lakeisha. Good morning. Good morning, people of God. It's time to wake up. Good morning, Sean. <laughs> come on, come on. Why did we go through these things? Thank you so much, my sis. Good morning, Leticia. I said, good to see you last night. Yes, yes. Good morning, Bree. Good morning, Sister Wanda. Good morning. time last night. Good morning, Gina. Good morning, Karen. Good morning. Go with me, brothers and sisters, to John. Chapter number eight. Starting at verse number two. Good morning, Pastor. Good morning, Elder Moss. St. John, chapter number eight. Verse number two. Starting at verse number two. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Robin. Good morning.
Hey, Margaret. <laughs> good morning, Delina. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, people of God. Good morning. Good morning, Tanya. Turn with me, brothers and sisters, to John chapter number eight. We're going to be verse read a few uh, verses today. We're going to move all the way down from the second verse down to the 11th verse of the eighth chapter of St. John. Good morning, everybody. Wake up with the word. It is, I believe, uh, October the 18th. It is uh, on a Wednesday. We had a wonderful time last night at Bible study uh, talking about how to bring come from brokenness to wholeness. Talked about we have to be uh, teachable, we have to be humble, and we have to be changeable. Uh, so we start talking about that last night. We went, we got through, we have to be humble, and that we actually have to be teachable. And then we're going to pick up on that next week and talk about how we have to be changeable uh, in order to move into the things of God and move into our wholeness from our broken situation. So um, pray for us, pray, pray for one another uh, as we challenge and allow the Holy Spirit to change us and to um, um, uh, teach us and to convict us. In fact, last night, I got a couple of um, text messages last night uh, asking for prayer because the, the, the word of God had challenged, um, challenged us, which was, which is great. And, uh, uh, a couple of people said how uncomfortable it is at Bible study and, and, and how grateful we are to be uncomfortable sometimes in Bible study. And so let's pray for one another as we grow and in becoming what God wants us to be. Okay. St. John chapter number eight, verse number two, very, very familiar passage of scriptures that you and I have read in Sunday school. If we've been in Sunday school, we've read a long time ago. Here's what it says. At dawn, uh, he appeared, this is Jesus, appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. Verse number three, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis of accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said unto them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Verse number eight is where we are now. Again, he stooped down and, and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard him began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Uh, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned thee? She says, no one, Lord. He said, then neither do I condemn thee. Jesus declared to her, Go now in peace and leave your life of sin. Brothers and sisters, I grew up in a church that, that um, was for saved people who acted like saved people, who lived like saved people ought to live. In fact, the church had, had to be kept sanctified. I heard that a lot when I was growing up. Had to be kept clean and pure. So there were certain sins that if were committed would result in being excommunicated from the ranks and the community of the believers. However, there was other sins that I remember that we could pray for, that we could work on, or, or that we could be patient with. The church was proud of itself uh, because it was called a, ch a church full of truth. It was a truth church. It was a clean church. It was a sanctified church. On the other end of the spectrum, we are living in a time, brothers and sisters, when those who declare that church is for everyone, regardless of someone's belief or their behavior. These are churches uh, and people of God that value openness, tolerance, and acceptance above what conservative churches would consider orthodox or truth. Growing up, we, we call churches like this liberal or sect churches. You see, the problem with this approach is similar to the problem of the conservative staunch church. You have to pick and choose which, which part of the New Testament you want to embrace. 
See, the casualty, the casualty in liberal churches is truth. Truth has such a has an absolute tone with it about in our culture. And our culture, my brothers and sisters, is grown increasingly uneasy with the idea of absolute truth. If there's a right way of doing things, then naturally there is a wrong way as well of doing it. And today, nobody wants to be wrong. So along with truth, the idea of sin becomes a casualty as well. But the New Testament, my brothers and sisters, is very clear. We are not mistakers in need of correction. No, no, we are not mistakers in need of correction. We are sinners in need of a savior. We need more than a second chance. We, we need a second birth. Not surprising, my friends, not, not surprising at all that, that on both sides of the spectrum, spectrum whether or not you are a, a person who is a staunch truth person and, and you're very strict in your approach to people and you, you're ready to throw people out with the, with the bathwater because they're not living up to a standard that you have uh, prescribed in a few scriptures that you know, or, or if you're on the other side of the spectrum where, where no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you believe that everybody and anybody should be able to, to do anything in the body of Christ. Now, no matter what, what side of the spectrum you are, because oftentimes we are on two sides of the extreme, Jesus himself modeled the way that all of us should live. He left us a remarkable approach for navigating through this sometimes very uneasy and sometimes messy tension. As an eyewitness of Jesus, uh, uh, the Apostle John summarized who Jesus was in the first chapter of his of his gospel. He said the word became flesh and dwelled among us and we saw his glory, the glory of the only and one and the only son of the father. Here's what he says, full of grace and truth. That's what he said. That's, that's what he said. He says, he says, we beheld his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Three, three verses later, G, uh, Paul, I mean, John picked this whole idea up where he says, uh, in, this, in the 17th verse, he says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I have fallen in love with this principle that John pulls out of this uh, the scripture, full of grace and full of truth. Not a balance between the two, but the full embodiment of both. Jesus, my friends, did not come to strike a balance between grace and truth as we oftentimes try to accomplish. No, 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 no. No, he brought a full measure of both. See, and John saw it firsthand. He watched Jesus apply the full measure of grace and truth to each individual he encountered. Yeah, you see, Jesus was in the crowd when Jesus, uh, John was in the crowd when Jesus said to the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, he says, I don't condemn you. Now leave your life of sin. Translated that to what, what would mean something to us. He said, you're a sinner. What you did was sin. It was wrong, but I do not condemn you. I'm not going to give you what you deserve. I'm extending to you exactly what you don't deserve. I'm going to give you grace. Jesus didn't try to strike a balance between grace and truth. My friends, no, he didn't water down the law. He didn't put a, uh, and he didn't put a condition on his grace. He gave full dose of both grace and truth. See, in Jesus, I, I've come to understand, brothers and sisters, we get a clear, uh, as close of a look as we're ever going to get to someone who operates in full grace, in full truth. Otherwise, otherwise we're, we're living in a graceless world that has turned its back on truth. I, I believe, brothers and sisters, this is where we are. We're in a place where, where we find people who are either great at truth or great at grace. We're, we find people who are either uh, consider themselves full orthodox. Uh, they don't tolerate any sin around them. They don't want to, to talk to you. They're full, of, they're full of truth. 
or they are called, they call themselves full of grace. But very seldom, brothers and sisters, and I believe that Jesus is modeling this to us, that in every encounter that we have, we should be both people that are full of grace and full of truth. It is artificial in conflict that often sends you and I toward an unhealthy and, and, unextre and unhelpful extremes. It is our misunderstanding of grace that Jesus modeled and taught us to leave as a feeling as if grace allows people to get by with things, with doing things with no accountability. It's often our misapplication uh, of truth that leaves people feeling condemned and isolated. But in Jesus, in Jesus himself, we discover that it doesn't have to be that way. Grace doesn't have to dumb down sin to make it more palatable. Grace doesn't have to. The purpose of truth isn't to isolate people from, the, from God or from his people, as we tried to do in the church when I was a child. As we follow Jesus through the Gospels, we find him acknowledging full implication of sin and yet not condemning sinners. The only group, my brothers and sisters, that he consistently condemned were graceless religious people who misused truth to control to, to throw about guilt and fear and condemnation. You see, it's easy uh, to create an all-truth model when you think you are uh, above everything, you think you got everything going on right now. It's easy to be all-truth where you don't tolerate people who are struggling with sin that you find repulsive. It's, it may be even easier sometimes to create an all-grace model that proclaims that God is content with us living any kind of way we want. But my friends, Jesus didn't, e didn't give either one of us the options of that. Now, if the idea of embracing the mess is uncomfortable to you, remember this. Either you were a mess, you are a mess right now, or you're one dumb decision from being in a mess. And when you were at your messiest version, you weren't looking for someone uh, to either condemn you or to lie to you. No, no. You were needing somebody to take you as you were and continuously help you grow toward being what God has designed for you to be. That's what Jesus did for me. And that's what Jesus is doing for you, too. That being the case, it seems to me that we should be his disciples. And here's where I'm challenging us on Wake Up With The Word. I, am, I, I found this, uh, this, this whole idea is in um, a book that was written by a pastor named Andy Stanley called uh, Deep and Wide. But he was, he was talking about that there, there has to be a challenge in us, brothers and sisters, that we, we become more like Jesus in that we, we honor the truth. The truth is the truth. That, and we can't water down what is sin. But neither... Are we somehow more superior uh, than people who are who are coming to us and they're they're not where we think we, they should be? And it's funny because I oftentimes see even in our own church where it, it's amazing to me that we have pockets of people who some of us think that we are so superior, so more spiritual than everybody else that we isolate and we pull ourselves away from people that we think are carnal or, or weaker than us. When in fact, they, they need us to embrace them. Uh, they need us to, to cover them. We need, they need us to be accountable uh, to them. And they, they need us to bring them both full of grace and full of truth. They, they, we need people in our lives. We, need, we, need, we don't need judges. We don't need, nor do we need people to, get, to make excuses for our sins. No, we need people who come to us and say, that was wrong. And then extend for, to us grace. We need, we need, we don't need a balance between grace and truth. We don't need people who are truth people and then other people who are grace people. We don't need churches that are full of truth and have no grace, nor do we need churches that are full of grace and have no truth. We need people of God who are, who are fully ready to embody both, full of both, that we are both full of grace and full of truth. I think that's what Jesus um, exemplified to us. That's what he wants from his disciples. That being the case, it seems to me that we should be his disciples, full of grace, full of truth. Am I a truth person? 
people often ask me um, in my church. They say, "Are you? Are your? Is your? Is your church a truth church? Do you do you preach the truth?" I say, "Yes, we're full of truth." Am I a grace person? Am am I full of grace? Am I totally open to receiving any and everybody to come into the church? Yes, full of grace, full of grace, and full of truth. I. I'm going to tell you the truth and then I'm going to love you and give you grace. Today, my brothers and sisters, anything unlike that is unchristlike and not to mention unhelpful to the kingdom of God. So today, brothers and sisters, I want you to be full of it. I want you to live your life in full measure. Ask God to, to show you how to become full measure of both grace and of both truth. Let's pray. God, um, John watched you. John watched our Savior as he walked in the earth encountering people who who full of sin, who needed a Savior. He didn't come to condemn them, but he came to give them both grace and truth. So God, I pray that we who you have left here on the earth to uh, carry out the, the kingdom agenda, that we would be people who would be full of grace, that we would have a reputation of being both full of grace and full of truth. God, be, help us that when we encounter people who are, who are moved into an area where we're not comfortable in, that they're moved into an area of sin and they're, they're worried and they're stressed and they're, but that we extend a hand to say, yes, it's, it's not right what you're doing. It's sin. But we're extending grace to say we're not condemning you. We're not, we're not throwing you out. We're causing us to, to be an example of Jesus Christ, full of grace, full of truth. God, I know the tension is oftentimes very messy and it and causes us a great deal of concern. And so therefore, we've, we've, we've had a, a tendency to stretch ourselves toward one place or the other. That the grace people are, can, are, are mad at the truth people and the truth people are looking down at the grace people. But God, I believe that today you're calling us to, uh, to pray for uh, not a balance, but to be full of both. That every time we encounter our brothers and our sisters, where even when we're, we're doing great things and when we're not, that we come to alongside one another, that we, that we have patience with one another, that we not compromise with one another, but that we, we come together and bring both truth and grace in the same package at the same time to the same person. God, help us. Help your children be full of grace, full of truth, so that we can be full of you. And this we pray. Make your face to shine upon us this day. Be gracious to your people. Give us your amazing peace. This we pray. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And let it be so in me. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. We'll see you tomorrow morning. God bless you.